Good morning, everyone, or, or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. Thank you very much for joining us in this uh, free webinar on managing uh, testing beyond test management tools by Robin Goldsmith. Um, this webinar is hosted by the International Institute for Software Testing, uh, the leader in software testing training and professional certifications. Um, you can visit us at um, www.testinginstitute.com or you can follow us at, on LinkedIn and Facebook and uh, you can also listen to um, a lot of our webinars on YouTube. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the website for the Testing Institute next week. During the webinar, please uh, feel free to write your questions by clicking the questions tab, uh, not the chat tab, the questions tab. And the instructor will try to, uh, to answer as many questions as possible during the webinar, and then he will try to catch up with the rest of the questions by the end of the, of the webinar. I'm really pleased to... Um, introduce to you um, uh, Robin Goldsmith if you have known if you have if you have not known him before uh, Robin is very uh, known in software engineering field in general he's been in the field actually before me I always remind Robin that I have attended one of his courses sometimes in the early days maybe in the early 80s or something um, but I'm pleased to have uh, Robin Goldsmith, not only uh, as a speaker of this webinar today, but also one of our senior instructors at the International Institute for Software Testing. Uh, with that um, being said, I'd like to um, give the uh, microphone to uh, Robin. Robin, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you, Magdi. And in spite of what Magdi says, I'm only 25 years old. And uh, so just a, a, you know, a few things about me. I work in a variety of areas, all related uh, to helping uh, organizations get the right results right, both uh, quality assurance and testing. I also do a lot in requirements and software acquisition, project and process management, metrics and return on investment. Actually done real work once upon a time, uh, for quite a while actually. Uh, was even a systems programmer and, and deep in the uh, technical realm. Uh, been a member of a couple of IEEE uh, standard working groups and uh, currently a member of another. And um, these have, 829 has to do with testing, 730 with software quality assurance. I've uh, been a subject expert for the International Institute for Business Analysis for their business analysis body and knowledge version two and for search softwarequality.com on tech target. I do have a book, uh, Discovering Real Business Requirements for Software Project Success and a forthcoming book, uh, focusing on writing agile user stories and acceptance tests. Now, today's webinar is a preview for a full day webinar called Managing the Testing Project or the Test Project. And we'll be presenting that live on Wednesday, September 9th, 9 to 4 Central Time uh, online. And uh, you know, this is uh, a pretty widely uh, taken uh, course, very popular. Uh, many people have taken it. Hopefully a few people have found it useful. And it's part of a four-day certified software test lead certification, okay, which uh, consists of four one-day courses. Each one has a, a brief certification exam at the end of the class. And if you pass all, take all four and pass all four of the certification exams, then you qualify for the CSTL certification. Now, in addition, as uh, Magdi mentioned, uh, 
you know, we have a number of uh, seminars that are available online uh, that have been recorded. Uh, the advantage, of course, of a live seminar is that you get the opportunity to interact with the uh, instructor. The advantage of a recorded seminar is that it's often a little bit more convenient. But I just want to point out that all four of the CSTL seminars are available in recorded form. So if you were able to perhaps want to attend a live one and a couple of recorded ones, you can mix and match and still qualify for the CSTL. So I hope that uh, you will enter into the, the questions uh, tab and I will do my best to read them. Sometimes it's hard for me to keep up with that. Uh, the window is not all that big. But if you would, please enter in the questions tab um, any objectives that you have, what brings you to this particular webinar, uh, any issues, any, any questions that you have. That uh, and I will endeavor to uh, uh, answer them. Being aware of your interests and your concerns, of course, helps me in customizing this class a little bit more uh, based upon your particulars. So if you have any issues, objectives, concerns, questions, please put them into the questions tab now, and uh, I'll. Uh, do my best to follow that. Um, let's see. So, let's see. Okay. So, I'll give you another another few seconds to uh, to answer that. Uh, and uh, you know, if you if you don't, uh, that's that's fine too. Okay. Well, let me continue on, and if you're typing uh, still, that's good. So let me share with you what I see as the objectives for today, and let's see if these seem understandable, reasonable, and fit with why you want to attend. So first thing is that we want to identify some common test management tool capabilities and limitations and and it's both sides and we want you to become aware and be able to describe some added benefits of managing testing as a project as opposed to managing it as an activity and that in doing so that's going to involve some some aspects of managing that go beyond what a test tool typically would do. And we want to give you a little bit more guidance so that you can apply some project, proven project management methods to testing's unique challenges so that you can go beyond what a test management tool alone can provide. Now, once again, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to share in the questions uh, tab, uh, what does test management mean to you? What does it include? Uh, you know, and uh, once again, put that in the, the Q&A, because uh, you know, what you think of as test management um, is going to once again help me shape and tailor this presentation as best I can to fit with your own experiences and, and uh, beliefs and, ex and uh, expectations. So if you would, please put in the questions tab. What does test management mean to you? What does that include? Okay. And uh, we'll look forward to any ideas that any of you can offer. Okay. And, uh, I think you'll you'll get more out of this presentation if you think about these questions and and contribute them so that we can interact a little bit more. So, give an, another couple of seconds here. Uh, 
know, any any ideas on what test management means to you? What does that include? What does it not include? Okay. So still not seeing anything either either here we go, reporting. Okay. Okay. So um okay. So team management, schedule, documentation issues, estimating time and resources after deciding on test strategy and reporting. The whole gamut of quality assurance and testing to ensure quality deliverables that meet users' expectations and specification of the product or system means to remove fear of making changes. Okay, good, excellent. So that um, will involve planning, execution, et cetera, managing all testing activities from test specification to reporting, uh, execution of test, including resources, reporting issues, and progress. Okay, super. So a lot, of, a lot of good answers there. Thank you very much. Let me um, share with you uh, what an article called the top 20 best test management tools from uh, softwaretestinghelp.com. Some of you may be familiar with that. Um, yeah. What'd they say? Creating and maintaining release and project and cycle. Uh, component information. Okay, so that's similar to something that somebody said. Creating and maintaining the test artifacts specific to each release or cycle for which we have requirements, test cases, etc. Okay, establishing traceability and uh, coverage of the test assets, test execution support, test suite creation, test execution, test status, capture, etc. Metric collection, reporting, graphic generation for analysis, bug tracking, defect management. So I think that's a, a fairly similar set of things to what uh, you said, although I think some people mention a couple of things that are a little bit different. Let me summarize that in a little bit different way. So first of all, I think test management tools are big on creating and storing and accessing and updating test cases. And they also tend to put uh, provide the capability to put those into suites or runs that are executed together. And Generally, test management tools are used to execute the tests, often in a standalone or, or at, uh, at night uh, type of situation, uh, and capture the results and then report on those results. Okay. And generally, there's some feedback there which may cause then uh, after analysis of what's been done, go back and change or add or update the, the test cases and so forth. And then another big part of test management is ordinarily involved with analyzing and reporting defects. And sometimes there's also analysis and reporting that relates back to things like test cycles. And each of those in turn provides feedback with opportunities for updating some of the prior steps and then repeating them and so forth. Now, the question is, what else is there to managing testing besides these things? And I, I would suggest that these things that are on in the boxes here pretty much uh, cover the, the uh, items that the uh, top 20 test management tools uh, article deals with. So 
what else is there you know besides just the standard stuff the test management tools do well i think that that's an important question because i think that it's a question that tends to be overlooked by a lot of people that are, are quote unquote managing testing and that they are largely relying on the tools to do a major part of their test management and that that could be a trap so the first thing i want you to realize is that if we think of testing as a project rather than an activity that's going to provide us some advantages and when we think of testing as a project it's really a sub project within the overall development project and the reason that thinking of testing as a project provides us additional advantages is that it allows us to take advantage of proven project management concepts and techniques and also to become aware of things that may be an over concentration on what the test management tool does uh, tends to mask so for those of you who are familiar with the project management institute and the pmp certification the PMBOK project management body of knowledge project is a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique service or result means that the, a project has a finite duration it has a beginning it has an end it produces deliverables and the fact that there may be repetition doesn't change that each occurrence is fundamentally unique now, one of the things that I like to do uh, when it's a, a little bit more manageable than in the uh, online mode here is that I, I ask participants in, in my courses to think back to their experience with projects and identify what the characteristics of the best projects are, what the characteristics of the worst projects are. Okay. And you know, you you can read these. I'm not going to dwell on them, but clear requirements and right resources and good communication, teamwork and available and all that good stuff tends to characterize best projects. Worst projects tend to have micromanagement, a lot of bickering, unclear roles, no follow through. Now, one of the things that makes it a bad project is that people do poor quality work perhaps in part because they often don't know what to do sometimes the project members don't have adequate skills they may not have appropriate tools resources get yanked off and so forth and then all of that stuff that's on the best side if we just say not or lack of then those things also get added to the worst projects list. And I would imagine that many of you can identify with these characteristics. And you can probably add one or two of your own. Now, what tends to get lost sight of, at least in my experience, is that the most important factor in project success is the project manager and for testing that would be the manager of the testing project now when we think about what the test management tools do they basically do none of this stuff they may assist in it but they don't really provide the clear requirements or the good communications or responsibilities and so forth and that makes a big difference now many of you may be familiar with some aspects of project management if you are you, you may well be familiar with what's called the project managers triangle 
And I think that this gives us a little bit different perspective and makes it, hopefully makes it clearer why simply knowing how to test is necessary but not sufficient for a successful testing project. So the project manager's triangle identifies three major variables. The product or scope, which is the combination of functionality and quality. So if a function does not have sufficient quality, one would say that that function has not been satisfied. So functionality and quality can, cannot be separated entirely, but they are not the same. Second corner of the uh, triangle is cost, which is primarily a function of resources and staffing. And the third corner is time or schedule. And Many of you have probably heard somebody seemingly sounding clever saying something like quality, cost, schedule, pick two. And I just want you to be aware that that is not clever. It is not right. That the real meaning of the project manager's triangle is that these are the only three variables that are really able to be varied and that you don't vary any of them directly. So if you want uh, you know, more functionality, higher quality, well, you generally achieve a change in one by changing one or both of the other. Now, historically, if you want better quality, better functionality, you're probably going to feel you need to add cost and time. Okay. Conversely, if you want to reduce cost, well, what's the typical thing? People simply you know, reduce functionality and quality or uh, maybe add time, whatever. So the thing that you need to realize is that quality, cost, and schedule, it's not pick two. Nobody wants just two out of three. We need to accomplish appropriate and necessary work adequately within available time and budget. Okay. And the other creature here is risk. Because if we change something, that incurs risks. If we don't change something, that incurs risks. And that's a, that's a critical element of managing a project, and it's also critical with testing. If you've studied project management, you've probably seen key project manager competencies, competencies as planning, organizing, directing, and controlling. There's a fifth competency that tends to be overlooked, and that's administering. Administering is doing the work of managing the project. And one of the first places that projects fail is that project managers don't give themselves time to do the work of managing the project. And when the project isn't managed, then the planning, organizing, directing, and controlling fall down. But there's more to it, and tools, the soft, you know, the test management tool, you know, can capture the results of planning and organizing and controlling and administering to some extent. But the tool does not do the planning or organizing or directing or controlling or administering. But there's also leading and coaching, delegating, negotiating, communicating, analyzing, designing, developing, implementing. And a key element of being a project manager, and this is also true of managing a test project, is that to the organization, the manager is the team. And to the team, the manager is the organization. 
which means that being a manager, being a project manager, is really probably the most difficult job because you're right out in the middle. Okay? And once again, test management tools and project management tools don't do any of this stuff. This is all person to person and thinking and analyzing and negotiating and so forth. In my analysis of why so many projects are disappointing, I find that overwhelmingly the most important critical success factor, or actually the, the failure of it, is the lack of commitment to delivering results. Now, I have to share with you that I present this type of information to project managers as well as testers and test managers and, and so forth. And when I say this, project managers invariably react very, very quickly and very quickly close their minds. Okay. They hear this, it they think they know what it means, they don't, and they say, I don't believe that, it's not true, and therefore I'm not going to listen to anything else. Okay, That type of thinking is one of the main reasons why project managers fail, because they don't understand the essence of commitment to delivering results. Okay, So, this isn't saying that you don't care or that you're not conscientious or that you're not willing to work hard. And, and that's what a lot of people think this statement is about. But in fact, commitment to delivering results is what's needed to overcome obstacles and persevere. Because if you don't overcome obstacles, and every project has obstacles, and if you don't overcome obstacles, if you don't persevere, then what ends up being delivered is excuses rather than results. The thing that characterizes successful projects is not that they don't have problems. It's that the team led by the project manager, perseveres to overcome the obstacles and thereby deliver the results. And that's the real difference. And too many projects and project managers don't understand this and instead give up and deliver excuses. So commitment to delivering results. And let's equate results with quality. That's what people want. Okay? It's what the client needs, what the client wants, what the client expects in a manner that satisfies so external, internal customers, management, the various standards, other stakeholders, participants, and the project manager himself or herself. So it's quality on time and within budget. Okay? And that's what perseverance gets us to. When we look at how projects work, project managers plan, organize, direct, control, and administer people, resources, time, tools, and risk to bring together a set of methods with a set of requirements into a set of tasks that when completed, produce a set of deliverables that in turn end up satisfying the goals. That's what's really happening. And the secret to effective project management is to go backwards. Start with the goals. Identify the deliverables that will achieve those goals. Identify the tasks that will bring those methods and uh, requirements together to produce those deliverables. That's the key. Now, 
a project manager and a test manager both have deliverables and they're somewhat similar. Project managers' deliverables are a little bit broader. Test managers or test management's uh, deliverables are obviously just related to testing. Now, where do the tools fit in? Once again, tools don't do most of this stuff. Tools can assist this. They can help you keep track of things. They can save you some effort, but they're not going to tell you, for instance, what the tests are that you need to perform or what the tasks are that you need to perform or the resources or the budget or schedule that's going to be involved. I would suggest that a test manager has to do a better job than the project manager. Why? Any thoughts? Okay. So if you would, write in the uh, uh, questions box. Uh, why would a test manager have to do a better job than a project manager? It looks like they have very similar things that they do. But in fact, the job of the test manager is in many ways harder. Any ideas? So if you would, write that in the questions box. Uh, I know I'm moving somewhat quickly here. But uh, give you a chance to put that in. Less time, less resources. That's, that's a big part of it. Okay. On the other hand, the project manager has to be concerned with all the parts of the project, not just the testing. So that could be the other side of that, Jack, right? Any additional thoughts? Okay, but certainly testing tends not to have the time and resources that it needs. Okay. Um, any additional thoughts? Okay. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit cynically here. Okay. If there's a problem in the project, the project manager can point to the testing people or to the developers or to the analysts or to the performance people or operations people or whatever. In other words, part of the project management role is the ability to point fingers elsewhere. Test managers don't have anyone to point to. They're at the end of the line. They're stuck. And that means that they have to do a better job because they just can't rely on on uh, pointing fingers. Okay, Somewhat cynical, but it's very true. I think many of you can identify with this. Now, many of you are indeed familiar with budgets and schedules that are unrealistic okay, for your testing. We we know that testing tends not to get sufficient time, sufficient resources okay, to do the work, the testing that we think is needed. Now, realize that ordinarily we don't get that sufficient time because somebody, and let's call them the boss, imposes on us less time, fewer resources than we would prefer to have. If the testing fails, won't the boss also fail? Even if they can point the finger at us, they still fail. So there's really no benefit to the boss for making testing fail. And yet, that's the outcome, that's the consequence of imposing inadequate budgets and schedules, isn't it? So when you know, when you look at the boss, you ask him, you know, why didn't you give us more time? They say, oh, well, there's somebody else telling me what I can do, some business requirement, legal requirement, what have you. Okay. But the fact is that the boss probably doesn't have a very good understanding of our work. They maybe don't really appreciate the need for testing. And by the way, 
many of you may be familiar with agile organizations that have increasingly turned away from having professional testers on agile teams. Okay. The premise that, hey, testing is just a part of development, developers have to be there anyhow, so let's just make the developers do the testing. And uh, some of us have seen that that doesn't always work out well. Part of misunderstanding is the this notion that any idiot can test and uh you know i think the idiocy there is the the belief that any idiot can test yes any idiot can test poorly but i think it takes a special kind of an idiot to test really well and i'm being facetious there i don't think you i don't think you're going to be a good tester and be an idiot i think it takes some smarts then there's what i refer to as the double whammy that is many projects set the testing budget and schedule as some kind of a ratio of the development budget and schedule and invariably the development budget and schedule is grossly underestimated and so testing gets an in, insufficient fraction of an insufficient development budget and schedule but there are some other things that I think you need to consider. And these, these are harder for people to come to grips with. Because at least from some perspectives, if the, if the boss is not buying our definition of time and budget required, in some ways, that's indicative that the boss doesn't believe what we are saying. Now, we all want to be believed. We all want to think we are believed. But we have to look at the outcome rather than our desires and our intentions. And also, we need to realize that very often, one of the reasons why we may not be believed is because we may not be all that clear in our own minds you know on on why we need the time that we say we need what we're going to do with it okay you know how we're going to use it okay so if we're not clear on that if we're just saying things like don't you care about quality okay um if the boss is not sharing our assumptions and the boss may also say of course I care about quality and what you're saying doesn't seem to me to have anything to do with quality so we think we're talking about quality and the boss doesn't okay? because in in a way we're saying boss if you don't do what we tell you it means you don't care about quality and bosses don't buy that very well. It tends to, to create resistance. So there are a variety of reasons why bosses cut our estimates. Some bosses do it thinking that it's a clever management technique, that if they give us a really tight budget and schedule, that uh, that will create urgency, that will be motivating, okay? and some of that is in fact motivated by the perception that engineering types tend to cry wolf there's never never enough time never enough resources and that left to their own devices engineers generally find things to do besides finishing so the problem is that there's more than a bit of truth in that stereotype of engineering people engineers do have a habit of whining they do have a habit of never finishing unless somebody holds their feet to the fire okay creating motivation not so okay yeah. give me an impossible budget and schedule that's not motivating it's demotivating now here's another Here's another little secret, folks. Um, 
it's pretty likely that uh, you've made some kind of a, an estimate of how long some, your testing is going to take, and then you double it. And your boss knows that trick. And so they automatically cut your estimate in half. Okay. So I say facetiously, make your estimate, double it, and then multiply by two. Okay. Now, the problem with that is the two times or four times nonsense is still nonsense. If you don't really have a reasonable basis for your estimate, doubling it doesn't make it better. Now, there's another issue at stake here, and that's what's called Parkinson's Law. Some of you may know it. Parkinson's Law says work expands to fill the available time. So a number of years ago, a professor named C. Northcote Parkinson wrote a little book called Parkinson's Law, in which he observed that the um, US military, after World War II, after the end of World War II, many of you may remember World War II, uh, it was kind of a big event, and there were millions and millions of people in the armed forces, and thousands of ships and airplanes and so forth. And what Parkinson discovered was that in the years following World War II, the peacetime years, there were actually more generals and admirals in the US military than there had been during World War II when they actually had something to do. And so he came up with this law, work expands to fill the available time. And so what a lot of managers know is that if they give you more time to do something, the only thing that is certain is that you will spend all the time that you've got. And that just giving more time does not appreciably increase the chances of delivering desired results. And so a lot of managers you know, really play hardball uh, and don't give additional time. Okay. Now, the fact is that if you don't have sufficient time, you do need more time. The problem is that when we get the more time, we don't use the more time beneficially. And if the boss feels that your basis for saying how long something is going to take doesn't have any real basis, then the boss is going to make some judgments. The boss is going to say, look, I can either rely on myself or rely on this idiot. And I know the idiot doesn't know what he or she is talking about. And so the boss says, I will override, overrule your estimate because I don't think you really know what you're talking about. Now, that's something, once again, that we find hard to believe. If we don't entertain it as a possibility, then there's a good chance that we're going to end up in trouble. So think about, uh, let's say you're going to take an airplane. Uh, for a flight. So let's say that you're going to fly from Boston, where I live, to uh, San Diego, where Magdi lives. And I go to an airline that flies from Boston to San Diego. And I say, how long will it take for a flight from Boston to San Diego? And the airline says, we can get you there in five hours and 23 minutes. Take, you know, door to door, gate to gate. Now, would you say to the airline, no, do it faster? Of course not. Of course not. Why not? Because the airline knows how long it takes. And how do we know that they know how long it takes? 
because they do those flights one, two, five times a day, every day for years. Okay. They're not shooting in the dark. They've got data. Okay. When people know what they're talking about, and what, or more importantly, when they are perceived as knowing what they're talking about, other people don't argue with them. Conversely, if somebody argues with you, which includes saying, no, you don't have as much time as you ask for, that's an indicator that they don't believe you, that they don't believe you know what you're talking about. Okay. So once again, we need to judge by the outcomes, not by our wishes or intents. So when we put these things together, one of the most common experiences that we and other people in the in the project world give is that somebody says, uh, how long is it going to take? And we say, this long. And they say, no, that's too long. Okay. And we say, oh, no, it's not too long. Okay. Don't you want quality? Don't you want success? You know, blah, 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 blah. You know, what we're saying or what we're being heard as saying is that we are promising not to deliver what the customer wants. Okay. And we couch it in things like, trust me, I'm a professional. I'm just being realistic. Okay. And what we don't recognize is that at, at some level, people are hearing us say, I promise to make this project fail. I'm promising you failure. We don't think that's what we're promising. But in a way, that's what we're promising. And that makes us a part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And the really big impact of this is that when we're only looking at failure, we only find ways to fail. We won't find ways to succeed. So the key to success is credibility. Okay. And credibility starts with a successful end. We have to be able to say, Here's where you've got to get, and we know how to get you there. We know what's needed. We know how to make it happen, and we manage by facts. Not, it can't be done. It can be done, but here's what it will take. Now, if what it will take is more than what we've currently got, there's a problem, but we are not in a position to allocate more time or resources. That's the job of the other folks. That's the job of the business, the boss. Okay. Now, consider when we say can't be done, all that you're going to get is failure. We have taken the power away from the boss, away from the customer, away from the business. When we say, here's a way it can be done, here's what it will take to do it, then the power goes back to where it needs to be, and it becomes their choice, will they do it or not. Now, the other piece of this is that you actually have to make it happen. So if you get the time and resources that you say is ne are necessary in order to accomplish this, then you've got to find the ways to make it happen. And that's why having your mind open to success is so critical. Because if you don't ha have commitment to making it happen, you only see ways to fail. Now, 
What that means is the commitment to delivering results is the top critical success factor. It's not simply caring or working hard. Both are necessary. Projects succeed or fail in the first 15 minutes. That's because a project succeeds or fails in the mind of the project manager. That's how long it takes for a project manager to either be committed to delivering results or being committed to failure. The project manager may not recognize it, but other people sense it unconsciously. So if we're going to succeed, we need to plan. You plan to help you succeed. And there's an old saying, if you fail to plan, plan to fail. Planning identifies what to do, how to do it, and what it will take in terms of resources, effort, duration, dependencies. Why do we do this? So that we will have what we need when we need it. So we can guide what we're doing, and so we can identify need for adjustments. That's why we plan, and that's how planning leads to success. Tools don't do that. Tools capture that information, maybe make it a little bit easier to work with, but the tool will not identify what to do or how to do it and so forth. Now, with testing, what we're doing is reducing risks. There's a fundamental relationship between risk and testing. The more testing, or rather the more risk, the more testing we need to do. Now, we can analyze risk at each level of planning and design and execution, okay? And so there is business impact and management risk. These things relate to the amount of risk and the amount of testing needed, but they don't tell us which testing is needed. Most of you do some kind of risk analysis in your testing. And traditional testing, which I consider reactive, tends to look at the risks of features and the risks of components. Features, what's the system or software do? Components, how's it built? Which are the ones that are most likely to have problems? Which are the ones that if they have problems will cause the biggest, prob biggest impact, the biggest problems? You multiply the impact times the likelihood, and, and traditional reactive testing will test the features and components that have the highest risks more. That's not wrong, but there are issues. Okay. Because it tends to come too late. So when you use an approach that I call proactive testing, and we describe this much more in the in the full day managing the test project seminar, we see how to anticipate and prioritize and do this very economically so that we test the highest risks not only more but also earlier. And the advantage, of course, of testing the higher risks earlier is that we can catch those bigger risks when they're easier to fix. And we end up ending up with a much better result. So test plans, as we use the term, are project plans. Project plans for the testing project, which we said is a sub-project within the overall project. So if you think about project plans, they deal with objectives and strategies and tasks and resources and schedules and so forth. Okay. Those are going to be based on the set of tests okay, that we need to demonstrate to give us confidence that our product works, okay, along with tasks and, and for supporting and hardware and facilities and, and other things, okay? And, but the test plan itself is not the set of test cases. And in fact, we have a 
we have two levels of test plans, master test plans and detailed test plans. A master test plan is needed to help you keep track of a set of detailed test plans. Okay. Depending upon the size of the thing we're dealing with, maybe we only need a detailed test plan. So we don't have to start and generate paper document after document after document. Detailed test plans identify a set of test designs, which describe features, functions, and capabilities. Test designs, in turn, identify a set of test cases, executable inputs and or conditions and expected results. Now notice, a test design specification is in a one-to-many relationship with test cases. We can also have test procedures that guide the execution of the test cases. And generally, test procedures are in a one-to-many relationship with test cases as well. So when we are aware of these one-to-many relationships, it enables us to be much more efficient we don't end up duplicating so much. We don't have so much redundant stuff. Okay. You've got a set of test cases, but we don't have to repeat the test design or the test procedure for each test case. Okay. You can end up with just a whole lot more and better testing. Now, we can also identify what's called a work breakdown structure, which identifies tasks necessary to accomplish something. And in a testing project, many of the tasks are test-driven. That is, that they are a function of the tests that we have. And we can group them, for instance, by simple or complex or functional or load testing, automated tests, and so forth. So we can group them to aid in managing and estimating. But realize the tasks that are involved in a test. Creating the tests, not just running them. Oh, and we got a plan for rerunning them. Okay, we have to analyze the results. We have to report the defects and determine things like defect density. Have to isolate the defects to identify their causes so they can be reproduced. We actually have to create the defect report you know, give it a title, uh, typically there's categorization involved. And then another activity that tends to be overlooked is advocating. Some percentage of the defects, people don't agree with your characterization of how serious it is. Okay. Now, when you think back to where most people uh, come up with estimates for testing, it's almost entirely on running the tests, executing the tests. Okay? They tend not to provide time for creating the tests. They tend not to provide time for rerunning. They don't really provide time for analyzing the results. They do provide a little time for reporting defects, but not enough, and they very seldom recognize the advocacy. Tools can help with some of this. They certainly can carry them some of the grunt work of uh, defect reporting and re executing the tests. They'll aid in rerunning the tests if you plan ahead. Okay, But creating the tests, analyzing the results, figuring out that defect to report, all of that is something that the tool can't do for you. The other thing that taking a project view enables us to become aware of that the test management tools are totally oblivious to are all the non-test driven things that we do. Administrative and support tasks, you know, meetings, and, and then we need for each of these relevant measures. Doing the test plans, creating the test environment, implementing tools, attending training, doing reporting, okay, supervising staff, hiring staff, and so forth. Okay. Now when testers 
compare the time that they spend on test-driven tasks versus administrative and support tasks, they tend to be dumbfounded by the, the percentage of time that they were totally oblivious. Most would say it's at least half their time. I once was with a group that said that the administrative and support tasks took about seven times as long as all the test-driven tasks. Test management tools are oblivious to this. So let's tie this together. Have we seen some capabilities of test management tools? Have we seen some limitations? Have we seen some added benefits of managing testing as a project rather than an activity? Okay, we become aware of a lot of stuff. We can use proven project management techniques. And hopefully you've seen some project management methods that you can apply to help you make your testing much more effective, much more credible, and much more successful. So my next free CSTL webinar is on Tuesday, August 18th. It's called Make Test Metrics Work for You, okay? 11 to 12 Central Time, okay? And Remember that this webinar is a preview for the all-day managing test projects, okay, on Wednesday, September 9th, and that is part of the week of certified software test lead classes. So, if you've got any questions, we still have a few seconds. I'll hang on for longer. If anybody wants, has any questions, please put them in the uh, questions box and I will do my best and Magdi do you want to say any words of wisdom here no just want to thank you so much uh, Robert for being with us today and sharing this amazing experience that you have there uh, and we look forward to your next uh, free webinar or on August 18 thank you sir okay thanks to okay. everyone who joined us today if you have questions and and don't have uh, uh, time to get them in before we close out here, uh, please email them to me at robin underscore goldsmith at iist.org.